Good morning, everybody. My name's John Whitaker, I'm the Engineering Director for Graphene at Manchester. Uh, we work across two facilities now in Manchester, the National Graphene Institute and the Graphene Engineering Innovation Centre. We want to welcome you to the National Graphene um, Institute and our Zoom colleagues uh, who join us on this normal day, normal, normal grey day in Manchester. Um, just been speaking to Kosha and I'm assured it's very similar in Singapore. So it's going to be many degrees warmer though than it is here. Uh, we're here to celebrate the book launch today, The New Architecture of Science, uh, Learning from Graphene. It's a book which was I was party to and I was introduced to the book uh, a while ago, I'm a little bit of a contributor. But we're, we're here to hear from the two authors. So we've got uh, Sakoshi Novoselov, who's a Nobel Prize winning pioneer in graphene, along with Sir Andre Geim, and uh, Professor Albion and Yaniva. She's a professor of architectural theory at the University of Manchester. So the running order is we're going to be hearing from the two authors initially, um, and then I'm going to give you my perspective from a, a building user. I'm going to be representing the researchers and the operational staff that have operated in here, and we'll give you a perspective on the book and how that's transferred actually into the operational arrangements around the building. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the speakers, um, and we could be able to take questions from the floor here from our colleagues on Zoom. And we'll hopefully give you some good feedback about how representative the book is of the actual design philosophy of the building right the way through to the operational status. So I take note, I'd like to invite Kostya, if you can be introducing. Thank you, Andrew. Right, so, so uh, good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, do, do you mind if I share the screen? Should be okay, Kosh, yeah. Okay, okay, let me, let me just uh, show. So it's really a great pleasure to, to, to be here uh, in Manchester, even though, even though virtually. And uh, so you can see my, my, my screen, right? Yes. Great. So uh, even though virtually, and frankly, it's always a pleasure to to be in uh, in the in the NGI, and I'll try to uh, highlight why why is it so, and why um, I do love this this the this building, and and I do love our our work in this in this building. But probably let's start uh, a little bit with the uh, with the background. Why do why did we need? this this building in the first place i don't think we need uh, an introduction to graphene in this uh, in uh, in this audience so it's uh, the thinnest possible material which uh, which uh, ha which has been isolated uh, 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 about what, 15 years years ago we started to, to work on it in in 2003 and we started with a very, very simplistic way of, of obtaining it using a scotch tape and exfoliating with the scotch tape and, uh, graphene from graphite crystal. So our first devices were extremely small, just, uh, just micron size. We quite rapidly grew to a large crystals, which allowed really uh, quite a number of, of, of different experiments to be, to be performed and it's really it was uh, uh, working at the unbelievable pace when when we moved from this scotch tape exfoliation to proper clean room use where we used all the uh, sophisticated uh, uh, nanotechnology equipment to create uh, proper devices and, and 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 do very interesting physics with with this material so despite the material is quite mundane it's it's, it's still uh, the, the 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 physics was so interesting that we really needed a full power of nanotechnology to investigate its properties and really the effects which we uh, which we observed are extremely exciting and i should probably say that even up to now with 15 years of a very intensive research in uh, into graphene it is still on the top of the scientific agenda for many many physicists and material scientists and engineers across the across the globe and there is quite a good reason for that it's it's the 
uh, all the unique properties of this material. It's, it's of course the thinnest material, as I said, but it's it's also very flexible. It's extremely strong, uh, transparent, electrically and thermally conductive, and so on. And that's the reason why a part of just scientific interest, we also worked uh, a lot on the on the possible applications of this material, ranging from optoelectronics to sensors to composite materials to 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 energy. And this very building really witnessed quite a number of those of those innovations in um, uh, in uh, real life applications from composite materials. These days, every single Ford car would have graphene under the bonnet. Uh, most of the mobile phones from China would have graphene for thermal dissipation. We have uh, many, many new devices, uh, electronic devices, which utilizes uh, graphene for, for example, for um, photo detectors. And uh, quite uh, extremely promising area is the um, membrane technology either for uh, for uh, filtration or for uh, for uh, energy and, and 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 batteries and of course uh, for some time there was a, a question can we produce enough graphene with with this with the scotch tape but luckily these days we have uh, quite a range of 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 different uh, methods how to produce graphene so uh, every single application which we are thinking about uh, would have its own uh, dedicated method how to how to produce graphene for this for for, for this or another uh, technology so that's quite a, that's quite a mouthful already of the of research of graphene but fortunately or unfortunately we didn't stop there and we went uh, way way beyond way beyond uh, uh, graphene alone. So the, the question was, if you can exfoliate uh, graphene from lead pencils, can you use other pencils to exfoliate other materials? And the answer is yes. And we we've been working with many. We created many other two-dimensional crystals. And these days we're talking about a family of two-dimensional materials and each of them is really worth, worthy of investigation and of course, very, very interesting, very exciting properties. But if that's not enough, what we also do, we create artificial materials starting from those two-dimensional crystals. And these days, a lot of research is done on these uh, heterostructured materials, which we can create on demand and um, as I said, these days it's probably one of the, the hottest uh, area of research uh, in the world and luckily Manchester is, is uh, still at the, at the leading position in this, uh, in this research and in this, in this race. So why am I telling you all of this? It's just for you to appreciate, so that the so all this all this work which I uh, which which uh, which I showed you was uh, was basically done within like maybe a, a decade. So uh, and very very quickly our research our research our graphene community grew from just a few people like Andre, Irina, uh, Ernie, myself. Uh, Volodya to these days maybe good two hundred people if not if not if not more so uh, there, there was an urgent needs in a dedicated facility to to do this research but it, but the diversity of research on 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 graphene was so huge that it was very very difficult to create a unique uh, and, and established facility. So we really needed to create a flexible and adaptive or, or both. And, uh, and Albena will talk uh, exactly why uh, was the difference between these two, two, two terms and how did we manage this. And um, I'll just say maybe a few words about the, um, uh, about, uh, about the ideas behind uh, NGI behind the architecture of this uh, of this building, but before before I do this, uh, I know that uh, I don't have 
have time to finish my talk, I just want to use this opportunity to thank many, many people who contributed to, to the very idea of, of, of NGI or to the design of, the, of, of NGI or to running of this, of, of, of NGI. So I know that I've got only uh, well, two, two, three minutes left. I'll try to, and there were so many, so many things like I've got to tell about about this this building. It's, it's after all, it's a good three years of my life and of of, of the life of all the all the architects who are now in the uh, in the audience. And but the the one idea behind this building is and um, that we knew from the very beginning that was the major uh, characteristics of any scientific building that it will never stop it uh, evolving it will it will always keep keep changing and that's so that's the idea we uh, we we started with and i hope that it did work uh, well uh, at the end so maybe just um, maybe just a couple of points how did we come uh, come with 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 all this? Uh, so, what were the 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 most uh, important criteria uh, when we started to 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 design this building? So, first of all, it's location. Vibrations is about the clean room, and the clean room uh, uh, connectivity is extremely important. We are limited to the uh, to the uh, plot of land which we've got, so we really have to manage the light propagation in the in the building combination between offices and labs uh, and then so the conference room is is really one of the interesting thing in this in this building and um i will probably what i will do uh i will just touch only on one on one aspect of this and i will leave all the other stories for the uh for uh, for the question time and just to answer the question, why are we are we here? Why we are exactly at uh, at at this spot? And uh, NGI is first of all, it's a club. So of course the facilities are extremely important, but at the end of the day, science is and and uh, engineering are done by actual people. So we need to make this this building working for all the for so many researchers on the campus so we really have to choose the very uh, the ideal location so for people from physics from uh, material science from uh, from computer science from chemistry from uh, from biology so to uh, to provide them an easy access to the building so that's the reason how we uh, how we got here and maybe just as a teaser I can tell you that this particular plot, this particular spot, have got an interesting history, and part of this history is behind you, on just just on this floor is this is the sink, and I think I will I will just stop here and leave and leave all the other uh, all the other stories for the questions. Thank you. Okay, okay. thank you very much, Kostya. Very clear. Uh, can we bring Albana, please? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, when When the uh, founders um, of science and technology studies uh, back in the uh, 70s pioneered explorations of science in the making, they rarely considered a space as a factor in scientific work and paid very little attention uh, to the architecture of the laboratory buildings. Gradually in the following decades, uh, more focus was placed on the importance of space, locality, and architecture in the production of scientific knowledge and the impact of cities on the credibility um, and the 
or cognitive authority of science. Yet in spite of the growing cross-fertilization of the two fields, architectural studies and science and technology studies, whenever architectural scholars deal with scientific buildings, they often forgot what happens in laboratories. Similarly, whenever science studies scholars um, tackle the architecture of science, they rarely discuss the specific architectural features of laboratories. It becomes therefore important uh, to review uh, and to renew this dialogue between the two uh, fields and the design of the National Graphene Institute in Manchester provided a unique opportunity to do this. The building is uh, one of the uh, finest examples, I would say, of the new generation of science buildings designed uh, since the beginning of 21st uh, century. It was completed in Manchester in 2015 and an entire graphene city was built consequently in Manchester with the Mazda and the Royce buildings uh, now completed on campus. Um, the architectural scholar Ben uh, Blackwell, who is here with us uh, today, is um, uh, tracing um, the emergence of graphene city and the fascinating graphene ecology that has an impact on uh, Manchester uh, today. Um, we, uh, in this book with Kostya, we focus on the National Graphene Institute building, so the first building from uh, this uh, graphene uh, city. And our intention in this book is to shed light on how contemporary lab architecture uh, responds to the uh, dynamic and multi-applicational ambitions of science. Uh, so the book waves together two tales about the building. Um, Kostya as a lead scientist and I would say one of the designers of the building because he was actively involved uh, and I look at the two architects we have with us today Julian and uh, Stephen and they will agree with me so Kostya tells the story of the making of the building uh, and analyzes its distinctive design features and I, as an architectural theorist and anthropologist, I tell a story about how the building works today and how it is experienced um, now by scientists, facility managers, technicians, administrators, and other uh, users. And I see uh, some of the people I have interviewed um, uh, representing the users. I'm happy to see them in this room. The study of uh, the NGI is uh, different from previous studies of scientific labs in a number of ways. Uh, first, it accounts how the practice of science itself has changed during the past decades. And here I call Kostya. Uh, each scientific period has its own heroes. Uh, there were carbon nanotubes, high temperature superconductors before, and now graphene is the hero. So due to the application driven character of graphene science, um, research of the NGI requires a hybrid way of social and uh, cultural organization involving a range of shared spaces for scientists and industry people. The building gains an important role uh, to facilitate a very distinctive way for pursuing research organized around the heroic agency of graphene. In consequential ways, graphene research can be both seen uh, in and understood through uh, an ethnography of the building that facilitates its development. If the most recent studies of lab architecture explored the spaces of communication, so mainly um, discussion rooms, conference rooms like this one and cafeteria where communication and discussion among scientists happens, um, here in this book, we scrutinize all spaces that matter for the course of research from uh, labs to gas rooms, uh, from utility blocks to atria. Attempting to understand how architecture reasserts its epistemic authority for contemporary applied science, 
Our questions are, to what extent architecture continues to be significant uh, for the credibility of globalized science? How do different spatial choreographies facilitate different epistemic and social practices related to graphene research? The methods I used as an anthropologist uh, to study the experience of users in the building uh, include, involve uh, interviews, semi-structured interviews with a range of uh, participants um, and users of the building, ethnographic observation and ethnographic uh, walks, tours of the building, mainly facilitated by John. Uh, and um, of course, a lot of materials, archival uh, materials and research materials provided um, to me uh, by Kostya, uh, John and other uh, participants in this process. First, I studied the dialogue uh, between architects and scientists, as this dialogue, we know it from iconic examples, like uh, the Salk Institute in La Jolla, is an important factor uh, for the success of scientific labs. In the NGI case, uh, it was not a simple dialogue, but rather a unique partnership forged uh, between Kostya and the architects from the London-based firm um, uh, uh, Jessico and Wiles. Uh, so we have Tony Ling uh, here on the picture and Julian uh, Dickens uh, uh, with us uh, today, uh, as well as uh, architects uh, like Alan Thompson and Stephen Wright, who is also with us. Stephen is with us today uh, from uh, CH2M, the company who was in charge of the original technical architecture design of the NGI. So Stephen and Julian perhaps can answer some uh, of the questions related to this aspect of uh, the building. Um, in our first discussion with Kostya, uh, he told me, it was, I quote, it was a continuous fight between the architects and me. Uh, they were trying to enhance uh, the architectural feature. Uh, uh, sorry, I was trying to reduce the architectural features. They were trying to enhance them. So what you see uh, is basically the result of this battle. But we all try to maximize the space and make it as flexible for the future as possible. End of quote. An interesting exchange indeed happened between the two labs, the NGI on the one hand, and the lab of the architects in uh, London. Um, an exchange um, in which we see that while architects had to learn how to read and uh, decipher different formulas of graphene, grasping simultaneously what graphene is and what the practices of scientists at NGI would, uh, uh, would, would imply, uh, Kostya and other NGI scientists uh, had to learn how to uh, read architectural plans uh, and how to read the different shades of uh, black, gray, and blue on the architectural renderings and uh, to, be, to be able to imagine the facade or the clean room or other spaces in the building. Designing for graphene, as we see, had an impact both on the scientific and the architectural practices. It resulted in a building that works well today. And let us have now a very quick virtual tour in this building, uh, which you will, of course, uh, have the chance uh, to see yourself in a few uh, moments. Walking on Booth Street, we first noting this dazzling black envelope, um, black facade that breaks the monotonous pattern of red brick buildings and attracts the attention with its subtle uh, uh, reference to the hexagonal lattice uh, of carbon atoms and graphene formulas, which were used and incorporated in the facade. At the entrance, Beverly greets us at the reception desk and we have to sign up in a book as visitors. Once in the building, we can visit different spaces like the clean room uh, the st or standard labs. Um, um, there are 18 different standard labs in the building. Uh, uh, we see uh, Mark's lab, uh, 
on the previous picture here, we can see uh, the furnace lab and the chemistry lab with poly in the chemistry lab, um, the energy lab, and a close look at the environment and the material architecture of the lab. Uh, shows us to what extent the material architecture of uh, these uh, labs affords a continuous exchange and speedy experimentation. Uh, the lab is not a tacit stage for activities, but acts as an organizer of lab activities, facilitating and modifying the epistemic work. Close to the labs, we have the famous gray rooms, which serve for storage uh, of equipment, samples, um, and the installation of the apparatuses is done easily from uh, these gray rooms without the need for technicians to go in the lab and interrupt the work. To ensure that both the lab and the gray space function sm smoothly, we need technicians like Christopher, uh, who will connect the equipment from the lab to the gas room without creating disturbances in the research work. This is the central uh, utility uh, building, which contains all services um, managed by the estate department from where uh, gas, uh, water, and other services, uh, services are provided. Then we can, uh, uh, we can have a stop in the gas room uh, with, um, you know, where we witness the work of another technician, Chris Livingston, who is very important for the uh, experimental work in the labs. He's in charge of the gas room and ensures the smooth and uninterrupted functioning of the entire infrastructure. We can then visit the open lab, um, which is different than the uh, uh, standard design of the standard labs, uh, because glass uh, is largely used in these open labs, uh, um, and glass prevails and connects, uh, for instance, here, uh, the clean room to the open lab, uh, the offices to the atria, and this open architecture facilitates the flow of people and things and reinforces the idea of visibility as a condition of research efficiencies. Um, for instance, Andre's office is here, and um, um, uh, next to this, uh, to the open lab, uh, he's, uh, this allows him to be next to his students. Uh, and uh, he uh, likes this design because the design affords instant communication, uh, visibility um, to the equipment, easy access to the equipment, and also assistance when assistance is needed. Uh, problems can be quickly uh, fixed. Behind the glass, research is visible and its steps observable. No time is wasted as the architecture connects very quickly people, equipment, preparation and characterization processes. After crossing the open lab, we can stop in the atrium here and sit in a comfortable armchair um, facing the writable uh, walls. Black PVC material covers the walls and encourages scientists to write while chatting. Writing is a means of thinking through the exposure to other paths. Many discussions of research and industry groups uh, happen uh, here around this wall. The regime of visibility is reinforced by the design of the walls that actively participate in research by speeding up, again, communication, translating, modifying arguments on the spot. Then we stop in front of the energy lab, where we see beautifully presented colorful diagrams and charts that represent research projects. Walls operate differently here. In the social space, they are active participants in the collective crafting of knowledge. Here, they are instead projective surfaces of crafted knowledge. In both cases, the walls are not passive uh, decor. They actively mediate the work of making visible graphene research. They slow down the hectic course of graphene work so it can accelerate again. And the tour uh, ends here on this floor. 
where we have the uh, conference room where we are at the moment connected to a beautiful garden, which you can see through the window, where scientists often go out to uh, continue discussions or uh, continue uh, discussions after uh, an event held in this conference room. Uh, we, on that floor, we also have a corridor with offices where John's office is located. And from his office, he can monitor uh, the uh, performance of the entire building and other buildings on campus as well. Uh, and the social space for facilitating different social events and uh, uh, activities. In uh, conclusion, uh, the NGI exemplifies, I would say, the new generation of labs in a number of ways. We can call it a hybrid lab. It's not a modern lab any longer. It's a hybrid lab. First, at the NGI, the collective effort is omnipresent in all spaces. Isolation becomes virtually impossible. Second, visibility matters epistemically and socially. The NGI emphasizes the work of making research visible and the thought processes traceable from the facade through uh, to the writing walls and the see through surfaces everywhere. The confidence in the credibility of applied graphene research stems from this ubiquitous observability. Third, speed is in the veins of this building. Every design feature matters for it accelerates the course of graphene research. Even practices that temporarily slow down the work subsequently contribute to spinning up the machine of graphene research. Finally, to capture the specificity of this hybrid lab, we need to analyze both this, the technical features, the specificity of the technical infrastructure we have in the building and the variability of the human experience to treat these two aspects symmetrically. Tracing both of them allows us to make visible the work of many actors who generally remain silent and outside the limelight of studies of laboratory buildings. Actors like the lab technicians, facility managers, gas rooms and storage room technicians, house attendants and porters. They also contribute to the crafting of scientific knowledge. And this book is also about making their contributions visible. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Albina. Very, very enlightening. Um, uh, I'd just like to give a, just a few comments about from um, an operations directive perspective of of the building. Uh, having worked in buildings before, which were not designed for a specific task, it was very enlightening, really, to come into such a project at an early start. Uh, I was allowed to engage from a very early start and, and have an input with the design architects and we'll, we'll raise those at the moment. Just a, a few notes on the book itself. I I've, was a contributor to the book, um, spending many hours with Albana and her team. Um, I would call it an interrogation, but uh, the, the, this is uh, <laughs> certainly, there was a level of detail in the book which they, they wanted to tell the story about why it was such an important transition to work with the design architect right the way through to operational status and capturing very beautifully, uh, as Albina said, all the key elements and, and, and how, we're, how they were delivered. Uh, I just want to take, uh, so, so the book is a very good read for, for people who are around architecture in general and for, and for operational staff. I mean, I've recommended the book to many operational colleagues that, that when they're involved with buildings, I, having worked in buildings which were not designed for a purpose and they've been repurposed, there is an operational challenge. You've got operational boundaries. When you've had the luxury of a building like this, and we've, we've got many exemplars on campus now, this was a lead for the Royce and for the MECD that we do consider 
the operation side and how do we deliver over the tens of years it's the evolution of the building how do we repurpose the building not just for graphene and 2d materials as kosh has said it's very quickly evolving and i'll give you some examples about the laboratories in a moment how they've adapted so so the book is a very good read just just from that perspective and, and i would encourage everyone to uh, uh, get a copy uh, fundamentally for myself um this is the only building um which it had a, such a deep-rooted philosophy. Um, I've, I've been lucky to move on to my next building, which had a very, not as deep, but it was a very industrial-facing building, the Geek. But the, the, the amount of thought that went into the design of this building and the adaptability around the technologies that Kosha highlighted before, just even in the last decade, we've gone from the isolation to the application of graphene. And it's that adaptation uh, which has been key to the, the design of this building. But the people that work within the building, and these many colleagues out here today, the researchers, they're the key to this building, the technical team that we recruited to work. We've worked in partnership with those academics to actually adapt that space, work in that space. And and have to say the agility has been there. Compared to other buildings which can go through a six to nine month refit just to do a laboratory, I can pick the energy laboratory in the set, this is its seventh year of operation and it's gone through three incarnations. The downtime between each of those incarnations has been circa six to eight weeks. And that's just the logistics of getting the uh, academics equipment into that space. In terms of the facilities being delivered to that room, it's got all the facilities within that space that we need to adapt uh, for, for future research programs. And that's been very, very key uh, for certainly the agility around the research, but also COVID disruption put to one side, we've, it, we've had a very large research community. There's 120 in the building, but it's over 350 that use the building on a regular basis. The chemistry lab next door, there's actually a 30 strong chemistry lab next door. Can't hear it. The sound, the acoustic monitoring, the uh, controls from the emissions, the extracts, has all been built into the architecture of the building. That seminar spaces like this can work side by side with deliverable spaces. And this is part one of the key to the building. The central utility, uh, or the cub as we call it, this building is kind of two together with, with a nice veil around it. The cub, people go around the building, they don't realize the intensity of the plants within the building that is needed to deliver all the services to those laboratories. I'll then show you some of the photographs of all the, the, the hardware and approximately 50% of the capital value of this building went into the, uh, the M&E services. And that was a fairly significant chunk. And it's a very, very brave decision to make at such an early juncture, but it does pay dividends over the decades that kind of follow. But the building's a bit more than that. It's, it's not just a hub of activity. Um, and I really want to share with you just some of the staff that there's an immense proudness for the staff that kind of work in the building the actual what it's done for the careers from some of the early early so the pdr pdhd students pdras they've gone on to professorships they've accelerated so quickly because they've been able to adapt to the technologies and move it on at such an agile rate so just for the acceleration of 2d materials research it's been key for that alone as well as marrying the diversity across the clean rooms. The clean rooms is the heart of the building, a lot of the services, but it's not just the clean rooms. There's a large number of multidisciplinary laboratories and you've seen some of those uh, examples. One of the key things is the, the, the reduction in downtime for, for the estates. Yes, we've got a lot of central services in here and we do have planned downtimes to, to maintain those services. But in comparison to fragmented services, the actual percentage of downtime is at a minimum for a facility this complex. And, and, and that is testament to the fundamental design. You know, working with the design architects, as we said, Julian and Steve here today, they were very key in having those battles with Kostya about getting the cost and functionality as well as it looking exemplar, but also marrying that with the occupiers in the building, how do they work? How do visitors come to work? How do we engage those seminar spaces, those breakout spaces, the writable walls, the IT infrastructure around the building, 
the laboratories being on the doorstep of, of the uh, collaboration laboratories, it works. And, and that is testament to the design. Uh, just, just want to reflect on some comments and, and when, when I knew this event was happening, um, I've actually been capturing some comments and uh, I, I was here when the NGI was going through its uh, building and commissioning. Um, I, I was here as an operations director for three years and we've had many visitors, but there's just a couple of comments, which I think just sum up independent views of the buildings. And these are from, um, and someone says, how do you manage, uh, how do you manage to get so much capability into one building? These are from other Russell Group universities. They, they're using this as an example. How do you, and, and when we say, we put the facilities at the point of use, they're going back and it's music to their ears. They're going back to their estates directors, their funders. This is what we have to do, because it does work. Um, and Manchester is the envy of the world in this 2D material space. Um, working in the NGI has been the best start anyone could ha ever have in their career. So the, the, this is members of staff who come to me who are leaving the facility and going back to their home countries as associate professors or professors. And these are the comments that they're saying to me. So this is not me making it up. It's th this is actual feedback. The building is a, now our standard bearer. And that was for someone from AWE. They, they was actually astounded about how much work we've done and delivered. The contract, uh, one contractor who built the building was a part of the design team. He says, this is the best facility I have ever been involved with. And this chap, this gentleman's retired now. And every time he, 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 he's a member of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers and he's, he's a guest speaker and he always uses the NGI as an exemplar of ME because of the way it's been implemented throughout the building. And surprise, not surprisingly, the building is actually a bit of a tourist spot in Manchester. On the Oxford Road corridor, they go down to the museum, they go up to Mosey, and they stop off here. The amount of people that are having photographs taken outside this building is unbelievable. That is, I mean, it's iconic in terms of its veil and the formulations within the veil. It, you can come in the morning, you can come in the evening, and it has a different perspective in different lights. And even in a grey Manchester, Manchester day like this, I still think it outshines Mech D. That's my opinion. And I'll be very biased from that. So that's kind of my reflective view and perspective view about how we've delivered. It, it has worked for the members of staff that have worked in the building. It's very adaptable, and, and I think it's in a good place uh, for many decades to come. So that's my ramblings over. I think we'd like to take some questions either from the floor or on Zoom. We've got the design architects here, obviously we've got Kosh, we've got some building users here as well. So any questions that may want to raise, it's uh, over to you. Okay, sorry, I've got one. Just, yeah. just, just introduce yourself yeah. for the Zoom audience. Hi, uh, good day to everybody. My name is Dr. B. Hughes. I'm a member of faculty in uh, in, our, in Humanities, so part of Albana's um, school, as it were. So it's a real pleasure being here, and thank you very much for the brilliant oversight. I've got a question, really, of Albana, of course, but also the architect. Uh, and uh, we, we heard at the beginning of the presentation, you know, there's a battle between Costia's uh, vision for the building from a functional point of view, and, the, and therefore the tensions that arose between perhaps uh, those who were going to be using it and trying to design it and the architects. So really a question for the architects, what did you compromise on <laughs> with a client? Uh, and how did you get to the point where there was a, a unity of a viewpoint of the, of the design of the building and its function, because it's a highly complex building? Would you like to hand the microphone to Julian, please? Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name's Julian Dickens. Um, I, I, I now work at Dickens Architects, but I was previously involved in the company um, who designed the building. Um, and I work closely with uh, Costia and, and others and John on, on the project. Um, where did we make compromises? I mean, firstly, I'd say I wouldn't call them battles. I'd call it, call it collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, um, I'd say that that collaboration or that tension is absolutely essential to designing buildings like this because um, it's where interesting things happen, uh, where new ideas come about. 
uh, is in that kind of collaborative process, not just between architects and, and end users, but also between architects and, and engineers like Stephen here, who was the lead um, mechanical engineer on the project. Um, in terms of compromises, I mean, I remember starting out and uh, Costia was, was very insistent that we were gonna maximize the amount of net usable space in the building. So these types of buildings, um, they obviously contain net usable space, the clean rooms, the laboratories, the offices, things like that. But also um, the softer spaces, collaboration spaces, meeting rooms, seminar rooms, um, circulation spaces are very important as well. And, uh, and also plant spaces. So we tend to have quite, quite a large proportion of, of, of what we call balance space in these types of buildings, which is non net usable. And, uh, Costia was, was push, pushed us really hard to maximize the amount of net usable space within the building. Um, and um, we, but we did manage to carve out spaces like this. You'll have noticed the space um, just as you come through the, the um, lift lobby there, which is used as breakout space, the, 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 roof, the roof garden, uh, also the double height space that you'll see in some of the photographs and, uh, on the tour we managed to kind of carve out some of those spaces um, within the overall kind of envelope to encourage that kind of collaboration, um, which is absolutely key, not just in the design process, but in terms of um, the scientific process um, that happens within the building. Okay. Steve, do you have any comments? Yeah, maybe Kostya. Yeah, I can, I, I can probably add that if you, if you can hear me. Yes, we can, yeah. Right. So, yeah, uh, I agree with, with with Julian. It was, uh, I mean, it was really long, long-standing uh, process of learning each other's trade and 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 learn how to how to collaborate because that's the uh, those are the are the few things which we established from the very beginning. We knew for sure that. Uh, at certain moments and much sooner rather than later, we won't have enough space. So we need all the all the possible space we can we can gain, and we need all the possible space space which we could potentially convert from one use to another. And uh, and and also we knew that the uh, that the uh, dedication of this of this space uh, would would change with with time and already now with within the short period of time of the use of the building many labs had uh, did change its 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 functionality and there was a long long process to design all the infrastructure in such a way which would allow this change of the functionality without huge uh, capital costs and um, that's something which is not traditional in the architectural trade because so we need to create the perfect building for for its for its users but when the users do change every two every two three years and when the direction of uh, of of research the, the direction of use of those labs change as well how do we design this uh, this agile agile building and so i guess that was our our largest headache and oh, we, uh, it's up to albana to 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 tell us uh, if tony and julian and 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 steven and tom and and myself managed to do it at the end good thank you Kostya. uh steven do you have any comments on the uh, m e architecture yeah, good morning. Um, my name is Stephen Wright. I was the lead mechanical engineer on, on the project. And uh, yes, we did have some very uh, strong collaboration, some really, really strong collaborations over the time. But uh, I think uh, you, you'll agree that we, we eventually got to where we wanted to be and uh, at a reasonable uh, budget. And the thing that we always adopted was the the, the philosophy of uh, functionality over form to ensure that the building had the correct functionality. Julian always argued about the form of the building and how it looked, but the main, main the important aspect from us is the functionality of the building. And uh, 
thankfully we achieved it to most people's uh, acceptance. There's always uh, the people who hold the money always said that we spent too much, but you can't please all the people all of the time. But I should say that uh, actually in comparison with the other buildings on the on the campus, we were quite lucky we were building it in the right time. So the, the cost wasn't wasn't that, uh, that 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 large at the end, considering all the uh, all the labs and the complexity uh, and the complexity of the labs and um, uh, just uh, witnessing what what uh, Stephen just just said uh, at, at certain moments, Julian and and Tony just gave up. Said, "Okay, guys, we just do whatever you want with the with the functionality, and and we'll and we'll make it pretty at the end." And this whale whale story, it's a really fantastic idea, and it it it, it, it works on many 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 uh, functional ways as well. Not only as the making it uh, pretty, making it. Uh, some references to graphene, but it, it also structure. It covers a few hidden hidden places, which only John knows. So that's it was it was really a very interesting breakthrough. Now on the value, I would say it's a value for money. Yeah. Uh, to the floor now. We've got a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, hi, so I'm Stefan Bezorowski. I'm a professor of human geography and also at, at the Manchester Urban Institute. I have to say, so can you, um, sorry, pull the mic. Can, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, okay, better. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm super interested in the book and I'm going to ask Albina some questions, if that's okay. Um, and I have, I have two questions. Um, so first of all, I'd like to know, Albina, because um, you studied this and congratulations, it's amazing. And to, organize this and to get this conversation around so many so many groups and in, in a very living space so how do you okay you, you told us a little bit about the collaboration process you mentioned that so the, it was the architect it was the, uh, the the scientist with the vision were there any other stakeholders who else was involved in this process and what were the conflicts what were the tensions that arose how were they resolved can you maybe that seems to me like an interesting point to discuss um, because it's yeah. a, such a unique um, instance. And then maybe also, I think, and you mentioned that as well when you were talking, you said that the book, that the building is of the city. And how is it of the city? Uh, how is it of the city beyond people just looking at it? Uh -huh. um, can people, you know, does it reflect, how does it reflect the values of the city? Um, <coughs> Who are, you know, how does it reflect the governance of this? I'm, I'm curious to know if there's anything else that makes it of the city. Uh, yeah, I can use this, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you for this interesting questions. Uh, on the first point, the controversies and the disagreement, uh, I'm sure uh, Julian and uh, Koski and Stephen could share more, 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 most of those uh, disagreements. I haven't seen them uh, in my study that much. Um, on the contrary, the users were quite happy with the end result. And when I present the work, uh, I, I very often uh, uh, I have comments like you picturing this kind of really uh, happy users. Are they really happy? Didn't you find anything they complained about? Uh, can't you a little bit criticize the building as well? So I'm almost accused of being too positive, of liking too much. Uh, that building, but uh, uh, as an anthropologist, I have to reflect the reality, and the reality is that we really have happy users. Yeah, they, they were not that much uh, um, kind of concerns, like minor things, like the windows couldn't open, or like really minor things, uh, but I didn't encounter any big controversies or any big kind of concerns from the point of view of the users. And we are talking about 2000, uh, the, the moment I started, um, the study was 2017, so two years after the building was completed, and at that point also John was telling me, so there's still things that uh, we could find because this is this kind of phase 
of um, uh, post occupancy, uh, kind of the first two years of the existence of the building are, uh, is typically the phase where we can still find things and evaluate critically of what we could have done better. And even though this was that particular initial stage of the use of the building, there were not that many aspects the users were complaining uh, about. In that sense, there were not controversies, maybe there are hidden controversies or little disagreements uh, in the design and planning process, which I was unfortunately not able to uh, follow. And it's not that much part of the book. Uh, so in the book, we tell the story of the making and it's Kostya's voice. And I tell the story of the use which as it happens is uh, full of uh, happy stories of uh, users who are uh, enjoying this building because the building works well uh, for them. And when we say enjoyment, we don't talk about aesthetic enjoyment. Um, the architects will not be happy with this comment, but we talk about the functionality that uh, both John and Stephen were talking about. It's a, it's a building that works, that follow uh, the steps of the researchers that, that adapts and, and flexes around research activities. And that's what it, that's, that's why, and that's what makes it a, a smart building rather than just a, a, an aesthetically pleasing um, a building. Uh, the second point, Manchester could be uh, seen uh, perhaps um, in the walking, in the viewing gallery there. That's, that's uh, when you do the tour of the building, you'll notice that we have, um, the corridor in the clean room, um, which connects also visually uh, the laboratories and the, the so, so to say, hidden uh, clean rooms on the ground floor with the city uh, in a way that um, passers-by uh, can have a look and can witness what happens. Uh, they can literally witness science in the making, some laboratory work going on downstairs and the other way around researchers working in the clean room um, could make a contact with the rhythm of the city. So it's still a kind of visual contact. So Manchester and the NGI meet there visually, I would say, but I'm sure Stephen and Kostya will have more to say about the participation of the city and how Manchester contributed, uh, John, as well, to yeah, the building. Yeah, just additionally to that, um, Alpena, uh, with graphene being isolated at Manchester and the National Graphene Institute being at Manchester, there has been a, a level of ownership that Manchester uh, communities have taken on. There's a certain sense of pride that it was isolated in Manchester and it's a part of the University of Manchester. So there has been, uh, they, they've embraced it as a part of the corridor as we were, we were talking about before so so that bit has worked on the subject of conflicts um with any building with any operation uh, and certainly when academics are involved there's always conflicts of some description <laughs> <laughs> i think we can all witness that but the one of the challenges that when academics were moving to the building uh the one question was which office is mine and we just said uh well you're in this office with these two other academics really and that was one of the first challenges but those academics that are in those offices and sharing they're still in those offices today and they are still sharing six years later um, they do have offices in other departments and schools but their research office within the ngi is shared any any and, and it was that change of collaborative working especially across the disciplines which has been quite powerful as well so it's those initial challenges which was just a change in perspective for people coming within the building but you will always get i need a bigger space because at the university when they're decamping from say the jackson mill over on north campus and they're traveling over here they may have a 200 meter square laboratory which is largely an old teaching laboratory empty space largely unfit for purpose they're coming into a laboratory which is a lot more compact, still large, highly facilitized and highly fit for purpose. And it's when they've just go through the adaptive learning themselves, that's when they see the benefit of the, the, the design philosophy. Yeah. So yes, with any change, there's always a question, but it's actually when the academics generally embrace change a lot more than uh, normal operational staff. So when the academics do come in, we do, there's a kind of a level of acceptance. Okay, I'm getting on with it. And then, and then they move on. And then they start to see the benefits the, from the operational side and the delivery side of the building. So that we, we have had some 
the building has been growing and fl and, and I, I always say buildings flex they, fl they, they flex their muscles they flex their breathing and you only begin to understand the operational bounds of the building once people are in once they're they've got the full the process cooling loops at full the extract systems are at full belt the heating systems heating the whole building the clean rooms are actually doing numbers of air changes per hour with staff in them with equipment and this activity the building you start to ex see the flexibility of the building and that takes a couple of years so yes we get the classic snaggings you know pipes leaking air, air seals not working and, and we rectify them as we go along but the, the philosophy and the design principle behind the building, you're always going to get those niggles on a, on a complex facility. And we'll just deal with them getting on. They'll always be there. Every building will have them. Uh, but for the design philosophy of the building has been working as a deliver, deliverable. So that's just an, an, an addition to what you're saying. Um, any other questions? Oh, so Julian would like to add. Um, I just wanted to pick up on this question of uh, form and function. And... Uh, I mean, the architectural team, um, we kind of followed what quite a famous architect once said, which is that um, form follows function. And um, that was the kind of philosophy that, that we applied in, in, in designing the building. And then the second, I just want, I think your first question was about, um, about conflicts uh, during the process, the design process. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when you were asking the question, it, it kind of took me back to, um, I remember sitting in a room with Costia and a guy called Alan Thompson, who was meant to come today, but he, he couldn't make it. Um, and, and Alan was the kind of lead technical architect. And, um, so designing the clean rooms and the labs and, and those kind of things. And I was kind of with Tony leading the, the kind of general architecture team. And we had a debate about the bulk gases that are required, so nitrogen, hydrogen things like that we need to put the tank the tank somewhere and it's obviously quite a constrained site and so i i was kind of arguing to get them out of view basically from the outside of the building and 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 alan was was arguing well they should they need to be pushed away from because there's safety issues and things like that and they need to be pushed away and i remember the decision was taken um to, to push them outside the envelope of the building. And I, I remember walking away from that meeting thinking, well, that's, that's going to be really, you know, it's going to be a problem. But actually, interestingly, that was the genesis of the idea of the veil because we had an envelope of the building. We put the, the bulk gases to the south over there and then we, we wanted to screen the, the bulk gases. So we realised that actually if we have a double skin and we peel away, we can screen the bulk gases and then that, that idea developed into wrapping the whole building in a veil. So um, good solutions often come out of conflict like that. Okay, thank you, Julian. Um, any further questions? Okay, thank you. Mike behind you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I suppose my question is probably from an operationals perspective. I mean, there's obviously a lot of scripting and kind of analysis that's gone into making this building work from, you know, open plan and communication and the likes. I'm really curious sort of how you managed through the pandemic, especially considering laboratory work kind of sits in a unique position that many other office work doesn't. And then maybe how that affected collaboration and if there's uh, any kind of, you know, yeah, I the mean, the, the pandemic was a challenge for everybody. I mean, we have, we have to accept that. We, we had limited working. You know, the UK government implied restrictions on everybody and, and with, good re with good reason. Um, like the rest of the university and all, and all universities in the UK, we did shut down in mid-March for, for a period. But the, N the NGI was one of the first facilities to reopen in the June. Uh, we started... Um, what we did do, we actually put the building on standby. So we, we was given several weeks knowledge of the pandemic um, that we thought, you know, it, it might be inevitable that we close. You cannot just turn a building off like this. You have to tune it down because if we don't, the clean rooms would have taken six months, 12 months to recover. 
So what we do is we kept the, um, the building in a standby state. So all the gas processes that we've just been talking about, we put them in a safe state, all, all the high voltage equipment, all the magnets were, were, were cooled down, uh, were, were warmed up as the case may be. We put everything into a safe state, but the M&E plant was basically just kind of tuned down a little bit. So we were ready uh, and we were back up and running in the scope we were permitted within a few days. Um, we did have a skeleton staff and I, I was a part of that team and Polly was a part of that team where we looked after this building and other buildings um, just, just for keeping integrity on some of the services. But once we actually got the light to start what we call our graduated uh, we had a campus opening committee, which we were a part of. But how do we get people safely back into laboratories and working? So we, we in line with the national assessments, we, we had a limit on the numbers in laboratories, like a clean room would normally hold easily 120 people. We did airflow calculations. It, it's biologically one of the safest places on campus because it's the same as a, an in vitro facility, actually. Um, so so uh, a virology facility in terms of a the way it cleans and polishes the air. So it was that clean room wasn't so much a problem, but in general laboratories and general spaces. So this entire space, the seminar, we had desks almost set out like in an exam style when you did your 11 plus. You know, there was, oh, you, you weren't allowed to walk within two meters of somebody. And we had, a, we had a, about 20 researchers in the building. We, we started off with one in each laboratory. But those researchers also allowed us to start bringing the laboratory back online in a graduated fashion. And then when we got more kind of confidence around COVID management, we brought in two people to the laboratory. We then had issues around PPE and masks. So we, we had this, we were working with the campus opening group about safe methods of working. So we had all our standard risk assessments, but we had a COVID veil over everything we did. Uh, and this, and today, this is the first large scale meeting held in this building. Everything today had been limited just to uh, no more than 20 people on this upper floor. Um, but it's, we've all been double jab now. We've, you know, we've had COVID management in place. We've not had an outbreak on the university. So this is not specific to the NGI, it's specific to everybody. But the NGI and the facilities team within the NGI being lead researchers, we were leading the research repopulation of campus you know we had a teaching team we had research teams so we work very clearly with the MIB which is the Institute of Biotechnology we work with FBMH to ensure we kind of got self safe working and from my background in semiconductor for example we, we had a clean down processes for some of the tools like putting simple things like putting cellophane over keyboards when one user would come along they could peel back the cellophane put a new piece of cellophane it was very very low cost effective uh, and it was very good principles for other industries. And that was it. And, and all our, it was a coming together of the operational side and the researchers as well, because, you know, it's their careers. That was very important to get them back as quickly as practically possible. Uh, to date, now we're probably back to full operational capacity in terms of the laboratories, but we've still got the, 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 the call, we're going to call it the new normal now. But we're, we're entering into a phase now where, um, we're wearing masks as we're walking through the building. So that's the recommendation. What, how that's going to evolve. So, so it's been a long journey, a long story, but, but it wasn't just one day we were here, the next day we wasn't. It, it was a we, we graduated back over a nine month, 12 month period. But we've been, we've, we started operating in uh, June last year, not this June, June before. So, so we managed to get some good research out in that time, obviously not to the volumes we would have liked to, but, but that was the same restriction for everybody. It, but it's been a challenge for everybody. Okay, well, Alan, thank you. Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Mark Stanoff. I'm uh, a starting PhD here at the School of Architecture and I'm also an, an architect. Um, on, my, on all major projects, there's, a role of um, M&E engineer or services engineer. And I imagine on, on this one, it's quite, it would be quite, quite significant because there's a lot of this infrastructure running through the building, sort of ducts, plant rooms, uh, services, is, is what actually permits the sort of flexibility that, that was discussed and is in a way sort of a lifeblood 
of a of a sort of research driven building like this. So my question, I guess, was there is this achievement predominantly sort of result of collaboration between the, the scientists and and architects, or was there another additional role of of the sort of someone like a services engineer who, who influenced the project a lot? Um, yeah, good, thank you. Good, good question. It's about serviceability of the facilities going forward. How do we maintain? So yeah, it, we look at the life cycle. Um, we do a desops. Um, so with the design architects, we actually go through a rigorous test and validation for for commissioning, but also then how do we service those pieces of kit in the future? So Albina's shown uh, one of the plant rooms on the third floor with about a row of about eight pumps. If that pump was to fail, how do we get it out? There's actually a railing system. The, the, the main goods lift in the building goes to every floor. We can actually service the building going forward. So that, that's very important. So as a part of the architect's team, we've also once, we, once they've agreed, shall we say, the, spe the operating space, we then start to bring in kind of um, the, the commissioning engineers and then the estates and facilities. And I was a part of that team. How do we manage this space going forward? You know, if we need to change the infrastructure, how do we get a large air handling unit? And in the cup building, there's actually quite a large hole within the plinth with plates over it. That it can, so plant can be lifted out. We can repurpose the building in decades to come. That all has to be inbuilt into the design. So it's a part of the consultation process. But, but you are right. It's a very good question. It's about the serviceability of the building. I've got one point. Are there any questions that you've yeah. there's, there's none come up on my chat. And Andrew, is there any come up on yours? Are you aware of? It? No. Uh, okay, we've, we've run over a little bit. Um, but thank you very much for your time. Now we're going to um, break and we, there's going to be some tours of the NGI available. Um, so if you just kind of introduce yourself to Polly um, as you leave the room and then she'll try and orchestrate a tour of the NGI. And I'll be around for another hour or so if you need to ask me any questions. Any final comments from Albina or Kostya? I would like to ask Kostya now that he's in Singapore, uh, which spaces from the NGI he misses the most? <laughs> um, I mean, I don't even ask, don't even start on this. I mean, uh, I complain, yeah, I, I complain to, to Stephen and, and, and Alan bitterly. And, uh, and I mean, I was lucky to, uh, to work in, in the in the in the NGI and um, so I was lucky to work with this fantastic team and then once it is designed you you stop noticing this and believe me I'm building I'm setting up a new lab now in the building which wasn't designed for I mean it was designed for for scientific research but it wasn't uh, a result of collaboration. And I mean, if I start uh, telling you uh, all the mistakes which could have been avoided and which we avoided in the NGI, which are not, uh, which, which are not avoided here, you just, you just won't believe it. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's like, it's a list which is enough for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, another hour of our, of our talk i mean maybe it's a it's a good uh, it's a good project for for you Ben, just to take two buildings which are one which is built both scientific but one is built uh, with the uh, as a as a collaboration and one is built just from the uh, just from the general principles and you could and you could see how many how many mistakes are, are, are being are being made? Fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you to the floor for your for your time this morning and for listening to us. Uh, it's been very interesting for me just to have a reflective session. Yeah. Just uh, just oh, a final uh, just a thank you. I would like to thank you our publishers.
World Scientific, represented by Laurent and Sue uh, here. Have a look at the book. Uh, it's thanks to their uh, hard work and dedication that we managed to produce such a high quality book with uh, all um, color photographs and uh, responding also to a lot of demands from us and cost you to keep the two voices distinct and also the, the two voices the voice of the making of the experience like two narrative that narratives that also design and be presented in different ways in the book but they all meet in the photograph so we had also special requests for a, a publisher and we couldn't imagine a better publisher than world scientific so thank you uh, and thank you, uh, John, Alan, Polly, for making uh, this event possible. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.